On behalf of the uh, organizing committee, I would like to welcome you to the inaugural Australian Mises Seminar. We're at a critical juncture in Australian history. The state is receiving overwhelming intellectual and popular support for greater intervention into the economy and our private lives. Shame. Yes, shame. Politically, we have the unhappy choice between the evil party and the stupid party. <laughs> and now the Greens have added another dimension of evil stupidity in Australian politics. Um, but like many of you, I don't, I don't see the state as the grand protector of our economic and civil liberties, but rather its chief enemy. This incredible momentum of state interventionism must be stopped, but not with bombs, bullets, or blood. This battle must be fought and won on the battlefield of ideas. Uh, to quote one of my favorite movies, classical movies of all time, Ben-Hur, um, how do you fight an idea? The answer is with another idea. This is the foundation upon which the Mises Seminar was conceived. Our goal is to strengthen the intellectual movement of the Austrian School of Economics to pose a clear and present danger to the flawed anti-free market uh, rhetoric of the mainstream. Now, the Austrian School has stood for over a century as a beacon of sound economic analysis and theoretical insight second to none. But what fundamentally sets apart the Austrian School from the mainstream schools of economic thought is the consistent focus upon individual human action as the driving force behind economic activity, especially using praxeology as a, one of our key epistemologies. Now, Professor Ludwig von Mises is the most notable figurehead for the Austrian school, laying the foundations of monetary and business cycle theory, which has consistently been used by the Austrian school to foresee every major economic crisis in the past 100 years. Now, Mises also developed a theoretical basis of the impossibility of socialism due to the failure of economic calculation by the state, which was fulfilled in the collapse of the Soviet Union. And finally, Mises delineated the epistemological framework of economic analysis rooted in human action in his magnum opus, Human Action. These are just a few of his ingenious contributions. It is with great respect to these contributions that the Mises Seminar bears his name. Now, the legacy of his followers, such as Friedrich Hayek, who won the Nobel Prize in economics before it was defiled by the likes of Paul Krugman. Um, <laughs> so his followers, Israel Kirzner, and uh, especially Murray Rothbard, lives on today within institutions like the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama, uh, the Freedom and Property uh, Society, founded by honored guest tonight, uh, speaker Professor Hans Hermann Hopper, and also in the presidential campaign of Republican Congressman Ron Paul. Yeah. <laughs> the Australian Mises Seminar aims to be the genesis of an Austrian revival in this country and also in the Asia Pacific region. Now, Austrian economics is a value free school of economic thought that accurately informs us of the destructive consequences of government intervention into the economy. As libertarians, though, we seek to minimize or abolish state intervention into our economic and private lives. There was no greater defender of private property, economic freedom, and civil liberties than Murray Rothbard, and we honor his immense intellectual contribution in this seminar. So we aim in this MISA seminar to educate and advance libertarian political philosophy to create a vision of a peaceful and prosperous society free of state intervention. And I would now like to invite Neville Kennard, who's largely made this conference possible to introduce our most honored guest speaker. A, a colleague of Hans's, uh, Stefan Kinsella, um, Dr. Stefan Kinsella, who I've met at uh, the PFS at, uh, in Turkey, uh, has recently, he's written a little book and done a, does a course called Read Hoppy and Nothing is the Same. 
I can vouch for that because I'd been down the road, the the Nisi and Rothbardi and I'd, I'd, I'd read all those things. When I read Hoppy, something clicked that hadn't quite clicked before. Uh, radical, extreme, all of those things, but there's something very special in his viewpoints and, and the presentation of those viewpoints. It probably might need a few exposures, a few listenings, a few readings to sort of gather it all. I would urge you, we've got, the, we've got this terrific opportunity with Hans giving a, a talk now, and, we'll have, and, uh, and then another second talk tonight, and then tomorrow he's going to give two talks. I mean, we're, we're getting value for our, for our money here. Um, but I would urge you to heed, take in, and pursue a bit further. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Hans Hermann Hoppe. I would like to thank Neville Kennard, first of all, uh, for having sponsored my trip. Uh, I also want to thank Benjamin Marx, uh, who was the main spirit behind organizing this, this conference. Um, I thank you all for showing up for this event. As Neville Kennard indicated, I want to break up my speech in, into two parts, uh, have a little break in between. Uh, the first one is, so to speak, more critical, and then people always expect to do something constructive. Um, so I hope to say something constructive about what is the alternative to the state. But first, I want to, in the first part of this speech, I want to deal with what states, what states are. Um, and even before that, uh, I want to explain what I consider to be um, the problem of, of social order um, and begin with very elementary considerations. Uh, imagine uh, Robinson Crusoe alone on his, on his island. Um, he, of course, can do whatever he uh, pleases because for him, the question uh, concerning rules of orderly human conduct simply does not arise. Um, this question can obviously only arise if a second person, uh, Friday, appears on the scene. Um, yet even if we have two people, Crusoe and Friday, um, the question of what are the rules of human conduct would remain largely irrelevant as long as there is no scarcity. Uh, imagine, for instance, um, that we inhabit the Garden of Eden, um, where all external goods exist in, in superabundance. There's no scarcity of them, whatever we want we can have. Uh, these goods are, so to speak, free goods, just as the air that we breathe in and out is, is a free good. Um, whatever Crusoe does with these goods, his actions have absolutely no repercussions on Friday, what Friday can do. And the actions of Friday have no repercussions uh, on the actions of Robinson Crusoe because everything exists in superabundance. Um, because of this, it is to a large extent impossible that a conflict regarding the use of different goods could arise between Friday and Crusoe. Um, because for a conflict to be possible, um, it is necessary that a good is scarce, that there are not enough goods around. Um, and only if there is scarcity do there exist a need uh, 
to formulate rules of orderly human conduct. Only because of conflicts do we need rules. Um, now, but even in the Garden of Eden, some conflicts are still possible because some goods are scarce even in the Garden of Eden. Uh, there exist two scarce goods in the Garden of Eden. One is uh, the physical body of a person. We have, each of us has only one. We do not have an unlimited supply of physical bodies. And secondly, of course, the standing room where my body rests. So even in the Garden of Eden, it is possible that Robinson Crusoe wants to do something to Friday, to Friday's body, or Friday wants to do something to Robinson Crusoe's body. I do not have to describe what the possibilities are <laughs> in, in this regard, but it should be pretty clear that that possibility exists. And obviously, they cannot both occupy the same space. Um, if I want to stand on one place, the other person has simply no room to put his f feet down at exactly the same, at exactly the same place. Um, so accordingly, even in the Garden of Eden, we would need rules that make peaceful cooperation between um, Robinson Crusoe and Friday possible. And these rules would be rules uh, laying down who has exclusive control over these scarce goods, over those things over which conflicts can possibly arise. Um, and in the real world, of course, which is characterized by all around scarcity, not just bodies and standing room is scarce, every, almost everything is scarce, um, we need, um, we need rules allowing us to avoid otherwise uh, unavoidable conflicts that determine who has exclusive control over what and who has not exclusive control over what. Now, um, if we go into the history of social and political thought, uh, there have been many proposals made um, and offered as solutions to this problem of social order. Again, this problem of social order is the problem, how do we make peaceful relations, peaceful cooperation with human, uh, humans possible given the scarcity of objects and the possibility of conflicts over scarce, uh, scarce objects. Um, and the fact that many proposals have been made has led uh, many people to believe that, that there exists no single correct solution to this problem of social order. Um, but in fact, there does exist a correct solution to this, and I have not invented this solution. The solution has been discovered uh, hundreds, actually thousands of years before it has been reformulated, refined, and so forth. But uh, as soon as I will explain it, you will recognize that it is a very, very simple, uh, a simple solution. Um, the solution is basically uh, the idea of uh, private property. Now let me explain first the solution applied to the Garden of Eden, where the scarcity exists only with regard, with regard to scarcity of physical bodies and standing room, what rules would people most likely uh, accept as fair and just rules in order to avoid conflict in the Garden of Eden? Um, and then following that, I'll explain the rules that apply in uh, in the real world with all around scarcity. Now in the Garden of Eden, the solution is simply provided by a rule that says everybody um, may place or move his own body wherever he pleases, provided only that no one else is already standing there and occupying the same space. 
everybody is the exclusive owner of its own body, can do with his own body whatever he wants. If somebody else wants to do something to my body, then he needs my permission. And if I want to do something to somebody else's body, then I need his permission. Um, I don't want to go into great detail, but you see the alternatives that you could think of would immediately lead to conflicts. Uh, and again, recall the purpose of rules is to avoid conflicts regarding scarce resources. Rules that do not avoid conflicts are not norms or rules, they are perversions. The purpose of rules is to avoid conflict, not to create it. Now, outside of the Garden of Eden, that is in the realm of all around scarcity, um, the solution is provided by four logically interrelated rules. The first rule is, as I already said, that would also hold in the Garden of Eden. Every person is a private, exclusive owner of his own physical body. You could simply ask, uh, who else, if not Robinson Crusoe, should be the owner of Crusoe's own physical body? Should Friday be the exclusive owner of Robinson Crusoe's body? Um, or should Crusoe and Friday own the body jointly? Uh, and the answer is, of course, that the alternatives do not avoid conflicts. They make conflicts permanent. Um, and the second rule is, Every person is a private owner of all nature-given goods that he has perceived as scarce and put to some use um, before anybody else has done this. Um, and again, without going into a deep, sophisticated justification of these rules, which I can also give, I only appeal to your intuition. Uh, who else, if not the first person putting something that was previously unowned to some use, should be the owner? The second person, uh, the first and the second person together jointly, but that would automatically again lead to conflict, whereas if the first one is made the owner of it, he does so without running into any conflict because nobody else claimed these goods before. He was the first one. He appropriated them without any conflict. Anybody who comes later and then wants to have it would automatically, of course, run into conflict. And again, as I explained, the purpose of norms is to avoid conflicts, not to generate them. Um, the third rule is implied already in the first two. The third one is every person who, with the help of his body and his originally appropriated goods, that is goods that were previously owned, were taken possession of by the first to first time, produces now new products, thereby becomes the proper owner of these products, the exclusive owner of these products, provided only that in the process of production, he does not physically damage the property of other individuals. And the fourth rule, again implied already in the previous three, is once a good has been first appropriated or produced, ownership in it can be acquired only by means of a voluntary contractual transfer of its property title from a previous owner to a later owner. Again, let me just emphasize that anybody who just suggests different rules, suggests essentially rules that do not avoid conflict but create conflict, uh, and that we in our daily lives, in our daily private lives, by and large adhere to these rules and recognize them as of course, uh, what else 
could pe people possibly accept as fair, uh, as fair rules. Um, now, a few statements in order to emphasize these points. Um, contrary to the frequently heard claim that the institution of private property is only a convention, uh, it must be categorically stated that this is untrue. A convention serves a purpose and it is something to which there exists an alternative. This is what a convention is. So the convention has a purpose and if it's something is a convention then there exists an alternative to it. To give you an example, um, the Latin alphabet um, serves the purpose of written communication and there exists an alternative to it. We can also use the Cyrillic alphabet uh, that serves the same, the same purpose. Um, that is why it is referred to as a convention. The Latin alphabet is a convention. Uh, what, however, is the purpose of action norms? And I already pointed out what it is. Um, if no interpersonal conflict exists, if there is perfect harmony among mankind, you always do what I expect you to do, and I always do what you expect me to do, then we would not need any rules whatsoever. And there would be perfect, perfect harmony. Um, but since that does not exist, um, since there are conflicts, um, we do need norms, and it is the very purpose of norms to help avoid otherwise unavoidable conflict. A norm that generates conflict rather than help us avoid it is contrary to the very purpose of norms. It is, so to speak, a dysfunctional norm, or as I said before, it is a perversion. And with regard to the purpose of conflict avoidance, which is the sole purpose, so to speak, of norms, with regard to the purpose of conflict avoidance, the institution of private property is definitely not just a convention because there exists simply no alternative to it. If there are conflicts over scarce goods, the only way to solve it is to assign private property rights. I can control it, you cannot control it. You can control this, and I cannot control that. Otherwise, we would always have to assume perfect harmony among all interests, which simply does not exist. Only private or exclusive property makes it possible that all otherwise unavoidable conflicts can be avoided, and only the principle of property acquisition through acts of original appropriation performed by specific individuals at specific places and specific points in time makes it possible that conflict can be avoided from the beginning of mankind onward. Since only the first appropriation of some previously unappropriated good can be a conflict-free appropriation, simply because, by definition, no one else had any previous dealings with that particular good. Okay, now we come to the next important problem. Now, as important as the insight is that the institution of private property ultimately grounded in acts of original appropriation is without any alternative given our desire to avoid conflict, it is obviously not sufficient in order to establish a social order. Because even if everyone knows how conflicts can be avoided, it is still possible that people simply do not want to avoid conflict because they expect to benefit from conflict at the expense of other people. In fact, 
as long as mankind is what it is, there will always exist murderers, robbers, thieves, thugs, con artists, and you name it. Hence, every social order, if it is to be successfully maintained, requires an institution or requires institutions uh, and mechanisms designed to keep such rule breakers in check. And how do we accomplish this task? Um, and by whom should this task be accomplished? So libertarians do not believe in, uh, in perfect man, a transformation of mankind. Quite to the contrary, we have a very real, realistic view of mankind. There are evil, bad people out there, and what is the, bad, the best method in order to check these people, to control these people, to bring people to respect the rules that I initially explained? Now, the standard reply to this question, how do we enforce these rules, is to say this task, that is the enforcement of law and order, as I described law and order, is the first and the primary duty, and indeed the reason for the existence of the state. In particular, this is also the answer that classical liberals, such as my own intellectual master Ludwig von Mises, has given. Uh, but whether or not this is the correct answer depends, of course, on how is state defined? Um, now, according to the standard definition, this is not the definition that I make up, that is, so to speak, to what the generally agreed upon definition of the state. Um, the state is defined um, not as a regular specialized firm, rather it is defined as an agency that is characterized by two unique but logically connected features. The first feature is, and the decisive one is, the state is an agency that exercises a territorial monopoly of ultimate decision making. Um, that is, the state is the ultimate arbiter or the ultimate judge in every case of conflict including conflicts that involve the state or the agents of the state itself. Um, just to see if, if, you have a, uh, if you have a conflict with a state agent, let's say a conflict with a policeman, who decides who is right and wrong in this conflict? Uh, the, the answer is given by a judge that is employed by the same agency as a policeman. Um, so this is, this is the essential characteristic of a state. It is the ultimate judge in every case of conflict, including conflicts involving the state and its agents itself. Um, and the second part that is already implied in this second unique characteristic is, um, that the state is an agency that exercises a territorial monopoly of taxation. That is to say, the state is an agency that unilaterally fixes the price that private citizens must pay for the state's service as ultimate judge and enforcer of law and order. The state then also determines what is the price that you must pay for him to do this job of being the ultimate judge involving even conflicts uh, of state agents itself. Now, what are the fundamental errors of classical liberalism? I think they should have already become uh, uh, apparent by, uh, by defining precisely what the state does. So, as widespread as a standard view regarding the necessity of the institution of a state as a provider of law and order is, 
It stands first and foremost in clear contradiction to some elementary economic and moral laws and principles. First of, among economists and philosophers, there exist two nearly universally accepted propositions. The first one is, every monopoly is bad from the viewpoint of consumers, not from the viewpoint of producers. Every producer loves to have a monopoly. Um, I remember giving lectures to, to my students. Students always say, oh, you are working for free market institutes and so on. You must get huge amounts of money from businessmen. Um, the, the, the answer is uh, uh, businessmen hate competition. Businessmen like competition in all areas except in the area in which they themselves operate. <laughs> there they would love to have, uh, have a monopoly. So that's why I say, from the point of view of a consumer, monopolies are bad. And why, why are they bad? Um, because, uh, let me just define first what I mean by monopoly in order to avoid any misunderstanding. Monopoly is here understood as, in, in the classical meaning, as an exclusive privilege granted to a single producer of a commodity or service uh, or as the absence of free entry uh, into a particular line of production. Only one agency, agency A, may produce a given good or service X. Um, and such monopoly is obviously bad for consumers because it is shielded from potential new entrance into its line of production. And because of this, the price of the product will be higher than it otherwise would be, and the quality of the product will be lower than it otherwise would be. Now, the second proposition on which almost all economists and political philosophers agree is this. So, monopoly is allegedly bad. Um, second one is, however, the production of law and order, that is, in short, of security, security of our bodies and our property, is the primary function of the state as I have just defined it. And security is here understood in the wide sense that is also adopted in the American Declaration of uh, Independence as a protection of life, property, and the pursuit of happiness from domestic violence <coughs> and from foreign aggression. Now, obviously, both of these statements are apparently incompatible with each other, inconsistent with each other. Monopoly allegedly is bad. But in this area of production of law and order, everybody seems to think there we need a monopoly. Now, the fact that there is an inconsistency here has rarely caused any concern among philosophers and economists. Hardly anybody is even aware of this contradiction. Um, and insofar as people have recognized that there is some sort of contradiction that you cannot on the one hand say monopoly is bad and then on the other hand say but the state must of course be a monopoly of law and order insofar as people have just recognized this then they have typically taken the position that it is um, the, the first statement that might have flaws that monopolies are not always bad but the second one is certainly correct, that you need a monopoly state that produces law, law and order. Um, yet there are, in fact, fundamental theoretical reasons and mountains of empirical evidence that it is the second statement that is in error, that we need a monopoly provider of law and order. Now, as a territorial monopoly of ultimate decision-making and law enforcement, the state is not just like any other monopoly, such as 
a milk or a car monopoly that produces milk and cars of comparatively lower quality and higher price. In contrast to all other monopolies, the state uh, not only produces inferior goods, but it produces bads, it produces non-goods. In fact, it must first produce bads or non-goods, namely taking something from people against their will, uh, or causing conflicts and then deciding the conflict in its own favor in order to do any benefits that it bestows on other, on other people. Uh, to explain that in more detail, if an agency is the ultimate judge in every case of conflict, then it is also judge in all conflicts involving itself and consequently Instead of merely preventing and resolving conflicts, a monopolist of ultimate decision-making will also cause and provoke conflict in order to settle it to its own advantage. You hit somebody on the head, and then you say, I did that because you deserved it, you looked at me in a strange way, and you call your judges to your help, and they will just say, absolutely right, that's the way it was. That is, if, if one can only appeal to the state for justice, justice will be perverted in the favor of the state. Constitutions and Supreme Courts and such things notwithstanding. These constitutions and courts are also state constitutions and state courts and whatever limitations on state action they may set or find is invariably decided by agents of the very same institution that is under consideration. Predictably, the definition of property and protection of property will be continuously altered and the range of jurisdiction will be expanded to the state's advantage. That is, the idea of some given, eternal, immutable law that must be discovered will simply disappear and will be replaced by the idea of law as legislation, as something that is made up by the state, as arbitrary state-made state law. Um, to give you an give you an example, uh, when communism fell apart and people wanted to get their property back that had been uh, expropriated from, from them uh, during the communist regime, um, then they turned to the Supreme Courts in the so-called free Western countries, which allegedly protect private property. Do you think in any of these countries the Supreme Court then decided, of course, all the property has to be given back to the previous owners? In none of the states that was decided this. In all of the states, the Supreme Court said, yes, of course, we protect private property, but you won't get your private property back. And if what you get is compensation, but the compensation has nothing to do with the market value. Um, would you ever imagine that a Supreme Court would come to the conclusion that, oh, since we are funded by taxation, we ourselves are an illegitimate institution. No Supreme Court will ever come up with, with an idea like this. Would you ever imagine that a Supreme Court comes to the conclusion we should limit the range of jurisdiction, the range of decision making that Supreme Courts have the answer, I have never seen a Supreme Court ever doing something like this, and I'm betting my life on the fact that it will never happen in the future. No. Moreover, as ultimate judge, the state is also a monopolist of taxation. That is, it can unilaterally, without the consent of everyone affected, determine the price that its subject must pay for the state's provision of its perverted law, whatever it might be. However, a tax-funded life and property protection agency is a contradiction in term. The, the state is supposed to be protecting our life and property, 
but how is it protecting our life and property by first attacking our life and our property? That is, a tax-funded life and property protection agency is a contradiction in term. That is, an expropriating property protector. Um, <laughs> now, motivated as everyone else is by self-interest and by the fact that nobody likes to work, um, but equipped as it is with a unique power to tax, state agents will invariably strive to maximize expenditure on protection, and you can use almost the entire gross national product and pretend that you use it for protective purposes. Um, but, at the same, but at the same time, do as little as possible. The perfect position is um, you maximize expenditures and you minimize actual work. Who wouldn't like to be in that position? <laughs> so these are the general errors of statism, so to speak. Now I come to the specific errors of democratic states. Most people think, of course, that democratic states are some great invention, great improvement. What I want to show is that democratic states are even deteriorations or, as compared to what we had, what we had before. Um, the traditional pre-modern state form is that of an absolute monarchy. Um, yet monarchies were typically criticized uh, in particular also by classical liberals such as Mises and so forth, for being incompatible with the basic principle of equality before the law. M monarchies rested instead on, on personal privileges. Uh, there were higher, law higher laws that applied to the king and lower laws that applied to the rest of the people, so to speak. So the critics of monarchy argued the monarchical state had to be replaced by a democratic state, um, by opening participation and entry into the state government to everyone on equal terms, not just to an hereditary class of nobles and so forth. It was thought and it was claimed that the principle of equality of all before the law had been satisfied. Now, however, the democratic equality before the law is something entirely different and completely incompatible with the idea of one universal law applying to every person in exactly the same way and everywhere and at all times. In fact, the objectionable schism between a higher law applying to kings and a lower law applying to regular folks exists under democratic conditions just as, just as before. Um, it exists in the form of the difference between a higher public law that applies to public officials and a lower private law that applies to regular uh, to regular folks. Under democracy, everyone is equal in so far as entry into government is open to all on equal terms. Everyone can become king, so to speak, not only a privileged circle of people. Thus, in democracy, no personal privileges or privileged persons exist. However, functional privileges and privileged functions exist. Public officials, as long as they act in an official capacity, are governed and protected by public law and occupy thereby a privileged position vis-a-vis -vis persons acting under the mere authority of private law. To give you examples, um, Public officials, for instance, are permitted to finance or subsidize their own activities through taxes. 
if as a private person I simply take your money out of your wallet, this is considered to be a criminal offense and I will be punished. If as a public official I come to you and do exactly the same thing, this falls under public law, is considered to be a legal activity. Um, if as a private law I take you and beat you up and force you to work for me day and night, this would be considered kidnapping, uh, slavery, and whatever, and is, of course, a great offense. If I do that as a public official, then it is called public, public service, military draft, and things like this is perfectly all right. If, as a private citizen, I take your money and against your will and then give it to somebody else, this is considered to be stealing and fencing of stolen good. If I do that as a public official, then this, is, then this is called social policy or redistribution of income. Uh, from the point of those people who are affected by it, it makes absolutely no difference. So you realize quite clearly that there exists this difference between a uh, higher law applying to public officials, functionaries, and a lower law applying to normal citizens is just as much preserved under democratic conditions as it existed um, under, um, under, monarch under monarchies. Um, you can say, so to speak, uh, privilege and legal discrimination and the distinction between rulers and subjects will not disappear under democracy. To the contrary, rather than being restricted to princes and nobles, under democracy, privileges will be available to all. Everyone can engage in theft and live of stolen loot if only he becomes a public official. Now, what you can predict then is that under democratic conditions, the tendency of every monopoly of ultimate decision-making to increase the price of justice and to lower the quality of justice and to substitute injustice for justice is not diminished, but it is actually aggravated because everyone can engage in this. As, as a hereditary monopolist, now I come to some interesting differences between, monopoly, between monarchy and democracy. As a hereditary monopolist, a king or prince regards the territory and the people under his jurisdiction as his personal property and engages in the monopolistic exploitation of his property. Under democracy, Monopoly and monopolistic exploitation do not disappear. Rather, what happens with democracy is simply this. Instead of a prince and a nobility who regard the country as their private property, a temporary and interchangeable caretaker uh, is put in monopolistic charge of the country. The caretaker does not own the country. But as long as he is in office, he is permitted to use it to his own advantage. Um, he uses, so to speak, the current use of the country. In, in Latin terms, he has usufruct of, of the country, but he does not own the capital stock. Um, but this does not eliminate exploitation. To the contrary, it makes exploitation less calculating and carried out with little or no regard to the capital stock. Exploitation becomes short-sighted and capital consumption will be systematically promoted. Let me explain this by a simple example. Let's say I give you a house under two different conditions. In one case I say, I make you the owner of this house. You can sell the house in the market. You can pass it on to future generations. Um, uh, whatever you do to the house, you will see what happens to the price of the house in the market. And in the other case, I say, here you have the identical house, 
and you are made for four years a caretaker of this house. Uh, you cannot sell the house, you cannot pass it on to whoever you want to pass it on, but for four years you can draw any advantage that can be drawn out of this house and, and use it for your own personal advantage. Now ask yourself, will you act differently in these two different scenarios? And the answer is, of course, of course you will act very differently. In one case, you will try to preserve the capital value of the house uh, for the reason that you might want to pass it on to a future generation or for the reason that you might want to sell it for as high a market price as you can get. You will also take into consideration what are the repercussions of my actions that I perform with the house in terms of will this drop the market value of my house or will that increase the market value of my house. But if you just are a four-year, eight-year caretaker of the house, you will give a damn what happens to the capital value of the house. You will try to loot the capital value as quickly as possible because after four or eight years, you have no chance whatsoever anymore to do it. So this is, this is one fundamental difference between the activities of kings and the activities of, uh, of democratic of democratic politicians. But there is even more, more to this. Um, under, under monarchy, it is perfectly clear who the ruler is and who the ruled are. You know that I will never become the king. Um, and because of this, every attempt on the part of the monarchs to just increase taxation, uh, rip you off more, there will be a resistance. Why does he do this to us? Um, under, mon under democracy, the distinction between the rulers and the rule becomes blurred. Um, it exists nonetheless, but the illusion arises we all rule ourselves. Uh, it is uh, uh, ruled by the people, for the people, um, of, the, of the people. Right, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> And you, and you realize that, oh, maybe I end up on the other side of the coin. So it, it's not very nice if they rip me off, but maybe tomorrow I will be the one who rips other people off. <laughs> and that is, so to speak, a consolation prize. <laughs> so you do have, there is less resistance against these types of attempts to continuously uh, rip you off. Another important difference is this. People say, look, but democracy has the advantage. There's at least competition for the position of the rulers. And are we in favor of competition, whereas under monarchy, there's no competition. It's always clear who becomes the next king. And isn't that a monopoly? And wouldn't we have to just be opposed to that and be in favor of competition? Now, the answer to this is, yeah, competition is good as far as the production of good things is concerned. But competition is not good as far as the production of bad things is concerned. We would not want to have a competition who is the best prison guard, who is, who is the best murderer, um, who, is, who is the best demagogue and so forth. There we are happy if we have dilettants doing the job, people who are entirely incompetent to doing, do, doing the job. So we are not in favor of competition in all areas. We are in favor of competition in the production of goods, and we are against competition in the production of bads. To I illustrate this a little bit further, a king comes to power by accident of birth. Okay, he might be a bad guy. There are many bad guys, many bad kings in history. Nobody will deny this. But first thing has to be considered is this. A king is, of course, expected by his own dynasty to just keep the dynasty alive. After all, there are family who want to in inherit this stuff. If the guy gets too crazy, then his own family will see to it that he will be surrounded by people who control him 
and if that doesn't work, they will assign some close relative or distant relative to make the guy a cut a head shorter. Um, so kings were frequently killed because of these sorts of things. On the other hand, because he comes to power by accident of birth, kings are, of course, people who can be nice guys. Um, uh, just nice daddies, nice grandpas, and so forth, who do nice things and uh, are concerned about the wilderness and this and that, and leave the people more or less, more or less alone. Uh, think of, uh, think of uh, a guy like Prince Charles, if he would, if he would be the absolute ruler of uh, of Australia, I think he would definitely be an advantage of, over your current rulers. <laughs> On the other hand, if you ask yourself, how do, how do people rise to the top in a democracy? The answer is, you must be an intelligent bad guy in order to rise to the top. Um, Imagine you would say, I will, not, I will protect private property, I will not raise taxes, I will not engage in any type of redistribution. Those, I, I will abolish all types of welfare handouts. Um, what are your chances that you will rise to the top uh, in, in, in a big country? The answer is, you can forget it. Um, democracy is, so to speak, the guarantee that only bad people will rise to the top, and the more so the larger the country is. That might not be the case in a small village of 100 people where everybody knows each other and they know how they acquired their position. But as soon as the masses of people are large enough so that nobody knows from whom you steal and so forth, the worst people will rise to the top. Um, last, last thing, and this then I end the first part of this uh, the speech, to use a nice analogy between uh, democracy and, um, uh, and, and monarchy. Uh, when the Soviet Union fell apart, some people asked me, how do you explain that in these East Bloc countries, um, even during peacetime, uh, life expectancy declined, whereas in all other countries, life expectancy rose. And I thought about it for a while, and uh, I came up with the following answer. Um, communist countries were a specific, specific form of slavery. Uh, slavery is defined by two characteristics, so to speak. On the one hand, uh, you cannot run away. If you run away, the slave, the slave owner can capture you and kill you, beat you, whatever he wants. And secondly, they can assign you to do certain tasks. So in this sense, we have two types of slavery. We have the traditional type of slavery that we know from, um, from the United States and many, many other countries where you have private slave owners. But Communist countries were fulfilling this definition of slavery just as well. Because if you tried to run away from East Germany, for instance, they killed you. Uh, you had to stay there, and of course, they could also assign you to work. Uh, now ask yourself, would you rather, if you have no choice but to be a slave, would you rather want to be as privately owned slave, or would you want to be a publicly owned slave? And the answer is, of course, then if that's the only alternative I have, I prefer to be a privately owned slave every day, because my owner has an interest in preserving my value. After all, he wants to keep me healthy, he wants my life expectancy to rise, he wants me to have children, if possible, um, uh, he, he will take me to the doctor. Um, and life expectancy of privately owned slaves rose by and large in parallel to the life expectancy of the free population. Um, slaves in the Soviet Union 
where you did not own them privately, could rent them out in the private market and keep the money yourself, but you could nonetheless tell them what to do and prevent them from running away. You, ki you killed them en masse. Uh, you didn't do anything to preserve the capital value embodied um, in, the, in the slave. Uh, no private slave, no private owner of, of a cow, so to speak, uh, yeah, will deliberately kill the cow. Uh, but if it is a publicly owned cow, these cows will uh, en, masse, en masse kill. And this is precisely, again, what, what, democracy, what democracy does and promote. Uh, uh, with this, I end my first part of the speech. And as I, as I said, in the, uh, with a little break in the second part, I will now give the constructive alternative of how a society could work with, without this type of nonsense setup that I have described. Thank you.